dedication of the temple, they said, by the way, as well as something to be concerned about. Uh, Jeremiah expressed it this way in Jeremiah 12 and verse number 3. He said, but thou, O Lord, you know me. You've seen me. You've tried mine heart toward thee. And so throughout the scriptures, we see this emphasis that God knows me. He knows everything about me. Well, that raises the second question that I want to ask from this passage from Psalm 139, and that is, what did God know about David? David knew that God knew everything about him. Well, what is it specifically that God knew about David? Look at verse 2. He knew when David got up and when he sat down. That might seem mundane and trivial, but it's designed to show us that even the things that we would never keep track of, God knows about. How many times on the average do you stand up and sit down in a given day? Now with some of these Fitbit type watches, uh, you can get some information that you might not have gotten otherwise. I know occasionally my watch will tell me it's time to stand up and congratulate me when I do. And, uh, and it keeps up with it. And it will tell me how many times or how many hours of the day actually it keeps up, not with the specific number of times, but how many hours out of the day am I depicted as standing rather than just being a couch potato? And by the way, uh, I'm doing pretty well in that department, uh, so I'm not the couch potato that I thought I was. I'm standing up a lot more than I realized. But God knows if it were to come to it, he could tell me the very exact number of times that I sat down or got up on a given day. Number two, and more importantly, he says, you understand my thoughts afar off. Verse 2, the latter part of verse 2. God knows what you think. He knows what I think. And what's interesting about this word is that uh, in an earlier psalm, is David had expressed the understanding that God's distance from earth to heaven, or heaven to earth rather, does not keep him from knowing what's going on. Notice Psalm 33 in your copy of God's word. And zoom in on verse 13. Psalm 33 and verse number 13 the Lord looketh from heaven. What do we teach our children to sing? For the Father up above is looking down with love. So be careful, little hands, what you do, or feet where you go, mouth what you say, etc., etc. Because God is looking from heaven, and he's beholding how many? All the sons of men, from the place of his habitation, he looks upon all the inhabitants of the earth, and he fashioneth their hearts alike. He's no respecter of persons. He considers all their works. Every single thing that I do, every single word that I say, God knows about it, but he knows it about my thoughts before they even become actions. In fact, the original Hebrew in this passage, you understand my thought afar off, suggests that God sees not just the thought, but the evolution of the thought, what leads to my thinking that way on a particular occasion. What does the Bible say in Psalm 11 and verse 4? The Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord does what? His throne is in heaven, and his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. And sometimes he knows that our thoughts are emptiness and vanity, according to Psalm 91 and verse 14. And how often is our Lord depicted as knowing what was in man? John chapter 2 25. Jesus knows not only the action, but the thought that leads to the action. Now that's a remarkable thing. And so when you think you're thinking something that no one else knows and you think you're being really sneaky about it, be reminded of the fact that God knows what you're thinking even if you haven't told anyone else. He knows what I'm thinking. And so if I'm scheming to get back at someone for what I think they've done to me, God knows I'm scheming before I ever actually carry out the action. And it would help me to think about that before I go to the next step and to try to nip that in the bud and to stop it from becoming an action and to stop the thought from going any further. Number next, he knew everywhere that David went in his waking moments. Look at Psalm 139 and let's look back at verse number three. He says, you compassest my path and my lying down. 
So God is your GPS. He's with you all the time. Now, these devices that we have, these, these phones, they can be a great blessing at times under certain circumstances. You know there's a feature on there called Find My Friends where you can actually allow yourself and your location to be tracked. And I understand that hunters sometimes will make sure that they have a GPS location on their person so that if they were to get hurt or injured accidentally, someone could find their location and not have to wander out in the woods and hope that, that they could find them. They could actually walk right to the spot where they are. You know, these devices, uh, you can actually turn off the Find My Friends feature on your phone and to where it says location not available. But here's the way it works with God's GPS system. Your location's always available. You can't turn it off and say, God, I'm going to go off the grid for a while. You won't be able to find me. Jonah thought that he could actually go off the grid for a while and not be found. But he learned that God could find him anywhere and everywhere. And so David was aware of the fact that God knew everywhere that he was going and that God had essentially hemmed him in. But that wasn't looked upon as something God was doing to try to catch David in something. It's an encouragement to know that God is there. Look at verse 5 of Psalm 139. You beset me behind and before and watch, laid thine hand upon me. David, have you ever been alone? Yes. When? Well, when Saul was chasing me and wanting to kill me for no good reason, there were times when I was alone. Sure, I had there, those times when my men were with me also, but I also had some lonely times in, in caves by myself where I looked to my right and looked to my left and no man stood with me, Psalm 142. And so, David, do you know what it's like to be alone? Yes, I do, but I also know this. I'm never truly alone when God is with me. I'm always aware that he is aware of where I am and what I'm going through. Picture this. A widow has left the funeral home. She has left the grave site. She's come home. She's still surrounded by family and friends for a day or two, maybe three or four. The dishes are returned to the church building. And everyone's going home as they must and it's empty in the house. And there sits the chair where her husband sat for 50 years or where he sat for so many years of their 50-year marriage. There is his chair, his favorite chair, the chair he loved so much, and now it is empty. And it's quiet in the house. And a tear begins to form, and pretty soon the tears are now soft. The loneliness of this moment has really set in, and she's weeping. She's crying her eyes out. The elders don't know it. The preacher doesn't know it. The preachers don't know it. The, the members don't know it. If, if they knew, they'd be right there, lickety split, for her to lean on and cry with her and to pray with her. But they don't know. They just don't know she's going through this at this given moment in time. And she sobs. She weeps. And I'm asking. Does anyone know she saw? Does anyone know she's weak? Almighty God does. And there are times when we're lonely and we think, are we abandoned? And we might wonder out loud, God, are you still there? Those who are hurting need to read the Psalms because you'll find someone that's feeling what you're feeling. And you can go down the same path of a pet talk, so to say, you start off with a lament. God, it seems like I'm all alone. But I'm not even sure you're there sometimes. But then you think, wait a minute. God, you've always been there. I wouldn't be here now if it hadn't been for your past deliverances from difficult times. God, I, I, I've talked myself through this. I've prayed myself through it. I know you're there, and I, I thank you for always being there with me. But being alone and knowing that God is watching you is not just a... All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do so he can catch us doing something wrong sort of proposition, Hebrews 4.13. It's true, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, but I want to make this omnipresence of God more than just you better watch out what you're doing because I'm watching you and I'm going to get you for that because you think I didn't see what you just did. Oh, I saw it. That's not the way God wants his omnipresence 
to be understood or considered. He wants it to be looked upon as a comforting thing, not as a threatening thing. God, do you see me? See me. You know what I'm feeling right now? I do. And God, when my faith is wavering and I, I just need some reassurance, look, if you don't think being alone can cause you to start having some, some questions that you just need a little reassurance, go with me to Matthew chapter 11. The very same man that pointed confidently at the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and pointed others to him without hesitation, without reservation, is the very same man at the beginning of Matthew chapter 11 in verse 2, John the baptizer, where are you now? When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, watch this question, art thou he that should come or do we look for another? Now, how is Jesus going to respond to this request from John? Is he going to lambast him and say, how could you doubt me? How dare you act like I'm not who I claim to be? How could you apostatize when you were so confident in the past about who I am and pointed others to me and now you're doubting me? What's wrong with you, John? How could you lose your faith like that? I want you to notice what Jesus does. He tells those individuals in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 4 that had come and asked this simple question, are you the one that should come or do we look for another? He sends them back with this message. Go show John, see the word? Again. Again. Those things which you do hear and see, you tell him how you've seen the blind receive their sight, how the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And you tell him also that blessed is he soever shall not be offended in me. You tell him not to lose his faith and confidence in me that everything is fine. Just go show him again and tell him nothing's changed. I'm still proving every day that I am who he told people I was. And give him reassurance. Jesus doesn't write John off just because he has a question. And look, in your dark moments, difficult hours... You may have some questions, and I don't want you to think in your loneliness and your despair and your moment of doubt that you have lost your complete connection to God, but I, at a time like that, I need to be more faithful to believe that God is still there, that He's not abandoned me, that everything is okay, and that God is ever with me, and that He will never leave me nor forsake me. I'm so grateful for Psalm 56. Would you notice Psalm 56? You talk about a beautiful text of Scripture. Psalm 56 and verse number 8. Thou tellest, David is also writing this. He said, You tell my wanderings, you could plot my map of where I've been. You could take those dots and connect them and show everywhere that I've been on a given day or given week or month. God, you know all about that. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? What does that mean? Can you picture this? Picture just for the sake of illustration, God showing you a bottle. And you say, what is that? That's a collection of every tear you've ever cried. I have your name written on it. And these represent my knowledge of your pain. Your tears have been, as it were, figuratively collected by me and put in this bottle to show that I know what you do. I put them down in a book. Every time you've wept, I've made a note of it. What if God could show you a record like that? How would that make you feel? You care that much about me? You knew when I was hurting? Yes, I did. And so, David, what do you know about God? Well, I know that he knows me. What does God know about David? He knows when he sits down, when he gets up. He knows what he thinks, what he starts to think. He knows where he's been, where he's going. In fact, verse 3, the last part of the verse, you're acquainted with all my ways. God, you know everything about me. In fact, Proverbs 5.21 echoes this thought in wisdom literature. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, 
and he pondereth how many? All of his goings. And what does the Hebrews writer say again? Hebrews 4.13 All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so God knows everything that David did. Stop right there and let me make some application. Brother Glenn talked to us about this last night. There are places you can go by yourself that can affect more than just you. Yes. Go into a chat room and you're not by yourself in the sense that you are completely alone. But maybe your wife or maybe your husband does not know you're in this chat room and chatting with someone and it seems so innocent at the first. I did some marriage counseling of my own a few years ago in local work and the way this affair developed, the way it started was in a chat room. The woman wasn't looking at pictures of pornography on the screen. She was looking for someone to connect with because her husband was never with her ever, never paid any attention to her, never talked to her at all. He was busy hunting, golfing, and doing whatever else he wanted to do. And while she was lonely, she got online and started chatting with someone. It started out as just some kind of innocent chatter. But uh, this man seemed to care about her, would ask her questions, how's your day? He was connecting in a way that her husband wasn't. If she was dead wrong for doing what she did, her husband was dead wrong for ignoring her. They both needed some counseling to reconnect with each other in a scriptural way. But I want you to know that uh, every word that she typed, God knew she was typing before her husband ever figured it out. And there was a need for her to know that. that God knows what I'm doing right now, and I've got to stop this. A husband comes to me and tells me, look, I'm a salesman. I travel all the time. And when I'm in the hotel room and there's no family member around, that's when my weak moments come when it comes with pornography. Or I'm flipping channels and I get movie channels on the road that I don't normally get back home. And so there's some material available that I would never see in my house because I don't have access to that. But no one's in the room but me. And so now I think to myself, I'm all alone and I can do what I want. And how does that make you feel, I ask? When it's all said and done, it makes me feel dirty. It makes me feel like I've messed up in a way even though no one knows I know and I know God knows. I ended up telling this individual to take a little picture of their wedding and put it in the upper right-hand corner of the screen on the television when he was... Well, I said, if you have to post it note there, whatever you have to do, just be reminded that your wife is very much a part of your life and that even though she's not in the room with you she is in the room with you in the sense that you're still connected to her as her husband and God knows what you're doing what you're watching what you're seeing why should Proverbs 5 another woman cause you to be ravished with her no don't let that happen God knows what you're doing and please don't follow that path David what would you tell us when it comes to this matter, I would also want you to know verse number five of Psalm 139 that God knows, verse four actually, what I say. He knows every word that I say. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it. How much do you know about what I say, God? All together. Sometimes young people think, well, I can say things at school in front of my friends that I would never say in front of my parents. And that way my friends at school will think that I'm uh, up with the times or whatever the current phrase is. They'll think that I am just like they are and I'll fit in. I'll conform to the peer pressures so that I'll fit in. And so if you think that speaking that way is some way that you're getting by with because your parents don't know it, be reminded of your heavenly father and what he knows. David, what did you say? I said that there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. There were some in the days of Malachi who erroneously concluded that God didn't know what they were saying. And yet God told them, your words have been stout against me. Malachi 3, 13 to 15. And you know, God knows so much of what you're saying that he doesn't have to bug your room with some kind of electronic device 
You remember what the king of Syria was trying to figure out? How does, how does God, how does the, the king of Israel seem to know every word, everything that I'm up to? Someone had to tell him, well, Elisha the prophet was telling him the words you're speaking in the privacy of your own bedroom, 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse number 12. And so God is aware of what we do when we use our mouths to do evil, when we use our tongues to frame deceit. He knows it when we sit and slander our brother, Psalm 50 verses 19 and 20. He's a witness when we speak lying words, Jeremiah 29, 23. And David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. God, you see it, you know it, and I want to be reminded of that so much so that I will be purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Psalm 17 and verse number 3. Now here's the next question I want to ask. We've looked at what did David know about God. He knew that God knew him. What did God know about David? Now, here's the next question. How did God know what he knew about David? How? Well, look at verse 6, if you will, of Psalm 139. And notice the statement that David makes here. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. This is high. I cannot attain unto it. David is absolutely astonished at the glory and majesty of God's omnipresence. It's something that's so high and lifted up, he can't get his mind around it, wrap his mind around it. The loftiness of God is something that has astonished David, and he's aware of the omnipresence of God. Look at verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, well, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. Well, if I say, surely the darkness will cover me, the night will be light about me, as far as you're concerned, God, because to you the darkness doesn't hide, verse 12. The night's as bright as the day, says it shines like the daytime. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Stop for a moment and consider when most people commit their crime. They want to do it under the cover of darkness because they can't be seen. They can't be seen by who? Well, they can't be seen by their fellow man as easily. But God doesn't need night vision goggles to see what you're doing at night, what I'm doing at night. And this is the way it's worded in Isaiah 29 and verse 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us? Who knows us? Isaiah 29, 15. And what's the answer? God. Daniel would declare this about God in Daniel 2, 22. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness and the light dwells with him. God himself would ask this question. He would ask this in Jeremiah 23, 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? And what's the answer? Yes, you do. And God sees all and knows all, even when we might think we are hidden from his sight. You know, there's a principle that I want to go to Colossians 3 and notice with you. And that is this idea of doing what we do only when we think someone's watching us that might hold us accountable for what we're doing. And I would like to tell you that at the school of preaching, we never have this. But I've been told, and I'm not foolish, that there are some folks who will say a certain thing when certain teachers or the director's not around. But when the director or the teacher walks in the room, it's like, well, hello, brother Steve. How are you? And all of a sudden, they go from criticism to trying to butter up. Well, my Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, Whatsoever ye do, you do it heartily for whom? As to the Lord and not unto men. I want to be authentic for God. I'm not putting on a show for the director, for the teacher, for the elders, for the preacher, for the anyone that comes in... 
I'm just being genuine and this is who I am. God, I'm the same before you as I am anywhere. I, I don't want to put on an act. I'm going to do what I do as if it's being seen by you only because you see it all. And if I'm pleasing to God, then I know I'll be pleasing to others. Did you hear about this pianist who was uh, taking his recital lessons and then he had his first big performance in front of the, a crowd and his teacher sat in a box above him in a balcony box looking down on him performing. And when he finished his recital, the crowd was standing and applauding and very vigorously so, but the pianist did not look to the crowd first. His first look was to his master above him. And his first question, his first thought was, are you pleased, master, with my performance? And when he noticed that his master was applauding him, then and only then did he look to the crowd and accept their accolades. What is it that Colossians 3 and verse number 24 and 25 says? Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. You serve. Who am I serving anyway? The Lord Christ. I'm not, not cussing because I don't want the preacher and elders to think that I'm a bad person or my parents. or I'm not avoiding pornography because... I don't want to get caught by someone. I'm not, not watching this particular form of behavior because, oh no, what if so-and-so finds out that I was? I'm doing this because I love God. And you know what's great about God? He knows whether the click on the internet was a deliberate click or an errant one. Do you know what I mean? There are things you can see on the internet you were not looking for because of the schemes of men, the devices of Satan. These these individuals, have they're sick, they're twisted. They know a lot of kids are writing book reports about presidents of the United States and things of that nature. And some of these individuals will deliberately put in their links things that you think are going to be about a particular historical subject and it will direct you instead to a pornographic site. That's the scheme and methodology some of them are using. And look, if you're flipping channels and you didn't mean to see that, God knows you didn't mean to see that. But if you're sitting down at your computer and you're looking for things, that's a whole other matter. And God knows that too. I'm so grateful that God knows the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about me. And I don't have to worry about someone else's interpretation because I know that God knows the real truth about the matter. And he is my Lord, and he's the one I'm going to answer to. In fact, look at verse 25 of Colossians 3. He that doeth wrong, well, he'll receive for the wrong that he's done. And you'll know this, there's no respect of persons. God's going to judge me equitably and fair, fairly, whereas man may not. Man will not sometimes, but Christ always does. And so I know that the, the Bible teaches that God knows me and knows me when, you know, there's... There's, he saw me when no one else could yet see me. And when no ultrasound could yet pick me up on its technology and really zoom in for a look at me, God knew who I was. And he was there watching me even then in the womb. In fact, go back to Psalm 139 and notice this as we start closing out our study of this concept. Psalm 139. And here's the beauty of it. He says in verse number 13, Thou hast possessed my reins. He says, you've covered me in my mother's womb. He says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. If God knew what I, where I was when I was in the womb, and no one even knew I was there yet, you think he doesn't know where I am when I'm alive and I'm on the planet? He knows. From the womb to the tomb, God knows my location and he knows my circumstance. He says that David writes this here in verse number 15. My substance was curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth there within my mother's womb. Your eyes saw my substance. That wasn't completely formed yet. But in thy book all my members were written. Even when there was as if there were none of them yet. You saw it. 
you saw me. And how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should try to count them, well, I'd wake up still trying to count them because, God, there's no way I could ever capture the awesomeness of your essence. And so this is the beauty of God. He is so omnipresent. He knows everything about me and knows what I'm going through. Now, as we start closing out, I want you to notice that David was conscious of the omni-righteousness of God. God is all righteous. And here's what David writes at the end of Psalm 139. In verse number 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. You know, they're speaking against you wickedly, God. They're saying terrible things about you. Thine enemies are taking your name in vain. God knows that. Verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. This is the perfect kind of hatred. It's not the it's not the kind of hatred of the world. It's a holy hatred for sin and what it does. I hate them with a perfect hatred, it says in verse 22. And I count them mine enemies. And then this, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. And please see if there's any wicked way in me. If there is, help lead me in the way everlasting. I want to get rid of everything that should not be in my life. I don't want to set any wicked thing before mine eyes. Psalm 101, verse 3. I don't want to engage in any kind of uh, activity that would be displeasing to you, God. And even if no one else knows me, God, I know you do. My father, one day years ago as a gospel preacher, knocked on a lady's house for she was uh, actually in her uh, skimpy attire, to be quite honest with you. She was wearing not much. But she was out there in the open for anyone to see that was driving by. But when my father happened to be coming by, because he was the preacher, I guess, she was all of a sudden very self-conscious. Oh, Brother Clark, I didn't know you were coming by. And she was trying to cover up left and right. I want to ask you a question. Do we really think that we owe more to the preacher who might see us than the God who saw us the whole time we were uh, putting ourselves on display? Do we really think that uh, we have to answer more to a man than to the God of heaven? We need to be mindful of what we're doing and remember the statements that were made by Jesus to the church at Thyatira when he said this, I am he, this is Jesus, I search the reins and the hearts. I'll give to every one of you according to your works. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. He beholds the evil and the good that men do. And then this. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and 5. When the Lord comes in judgment, he will, quote, bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, things no one else knew that I was thinking will eventually come out in my actions, but if not, before the day of judgment, God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. So apparently, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas, does it? Oh, that's what the commercials want you and me, to, to, to think that, oh, if you'll just come to Vegas, you can do whatever you always wanted to do and don't ask to know. He does. And as long as he knows, that's all that really matters. And so I want to end this with a balanced thought. What does the omnipresence of God mean to you personally? As you think about being alone, by the way, I think we all, though we love fellowship and love our family's fellowship, I don't know about you, but I'm the way, this is the way I am. My mother used to be this way. I'm this way now. My time to be alone and to study and to meditate and to pray to God, to study His Word, my most effective peak is at a night out when everyone else is already going to bed, just alone with God. We all need that quiet time. Jesus got up a great while before day, went into a solitary place, and there prayed. When's your solitary time? 
And when you're alone and no one else is watching except for God, are you aware of two things? One, God is watching me because he cares for me, not because he's out to get me. Look at this as we close. Psalm 102. I want you to hear this text because it's a great comfort. Psalm 102, verse 18. David knew this would be written for generations to come. If indeed David be the author of this particular psalm, it says it's a prayer of the afflicted, and David certainly meets that criteria on many occasions. But this is the statement of Psalm 102 and verse 18. This will be written for generation to come. The people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. Why? He's looked down from the height of his sanctuary. <clears throat> from heaven did the Lord hold Behold the earth, why? To catch you doing something wrong so he can get you for it. Well, he's going to do that, but not because he wants to. No, why is God looking from heaven? To hear the groaning of the prisoner. To loose those that are appointed to death. And to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. I hope that you'll live before God by yourself in faith and confidence that he loves you and that he's there for you. This is about the same as we had before. I don't believe it had any years to come down because uh, they're off camp or off somewhere else. Very good to have everyone here. We're thankful for your presence. I would like to, to read through the prayer list right quick. Make sure that you take time to pray for these folks. Uh, we certainly want to pray for all of those that are away at Maywood Christian Camp uh, for their safe return and their, their good, uh, good time of fellowship with Christians. We also want to pray for the Kendrick family. Uh, Miss Betty was buried this past Monday, and uh, we need to keep that family in our prayers. Also, continue to remember Rita Jones and Marcy Jeffers, Joni Geary, Lloyd Wright, Patty Cowan, Rachel Reed, Levi Abbott, Lori Barber, Mackenzie Jones, Monique Stevenson, Brooke Wilbanks, Cope Moore, Stella Powell. Shirley Moses, Edna Jones, John Morton, and Yvonne Streeter. Added to the prayer list tonight, keep Chloe in your prayer. She's not feeling well. She's not able to be out tonight. We also want to keep uh, Bill and Beverly Watkins in your prayers. Uh, their son passed away earlier this month. Uh, I think Beverly is Julie Dodd's cousin. So please keep that family in your prayers. 
Also want to keep Jacob Motley in our prayers. He's in the hospital, not doing very well at all. And also uh, Carolyn Bradley, that's Kathy Shield's mom. Please keep her in your prayers as well. We'd like to remind everyone, if you have any glasses that uh, that you can collect that are in good shape, you can give those to Sylvia. And she's going to give those to the missionaries for Latin American missions, and they will make good use of those on the mission field. Also, don't forget that we're going to have a fellowship meal this Sunday, July 25th. And after that fellowship meal, which will follow morning worship, we'll have our afternoon worship at 2 p.m. So plan on having a spiritual feeding and a physical feeding and then another spiritual feeding all right in a row. Uh, since David's out of town, remind everyone that we won't have Tuesday morning Bible class this next week, the 27th. It'll begin again on August the 3rd. You can put that back as a yes on your calendar on August the 3rd. 30th and 31st, we've got two good things going. Uh, Friday night, the 30th, singing at Pleasant Grove from 7 to 8.30. And Saturday, the 31st, we're going to have the watermelon party at Don and Amelia's, and that'll begin about 2 p.m. So we encourage everyone that can to uh, plan on coming to, to that. There's a gospel meeting at Berea with Aaron Gallagher on August 1st, 1st through the 4th. Uh, there's more details about that on the bulletin board. There's also more details on the bulletin board about the uh, Hiawassee rafting trip on August 10th. There's a sign-up sheet there. And you can see Regina Keith if you have uh, any more questions about that. Be sure and check the bulletin board and the bulletins that, that are put out on Sunday uh, for other things that may be going on. There's not always time to say everything. If we have missed something up here that you'd like us to announce, you'll let us know. We'll be sure and do that. All the announcements I have at this time, you'll either grab a songbook or look up on the board. We will begin our, our service with songs. If you'd like to place a marker in your songbooks, if you're using that, the number 589, number 589 will be a song after the lesson. Before Brother Don comes up, we'll sing the first and last verses of number 246. Number 246. I love to tell a story of unseen things of You know that Jesse does a great job, don't he? Anything he does, he does a good job. Jesse, thank you so much. I love to sing as you when you lead 
singing. Tonight is going to be a it's going to be a lesson from the Bible, and also it's going to be an object lesson. It's going to be an object lesson. I'm going to take something, and we're going to talk about it. Some, and then we're going to apply it in scriptures. And the title of my lesson is "Happiness Is a New Bar of Soap." Happiness is a new bar of soap. I, I love a new bar of soap. You know, you open this thing up, and and uh. Man, it's just nice. I'm going to open it up here now. But I like it. And I'm sure you do too. But happiness is a new bar of soap. Mmm, smells good. I'm telling you what. How am I going to apply this? Well, you know, I wrote a bunch of notes here. This page, this thing's got 50 pages. And I wrote on every page except 48 of them. So I wrote two pages. So it's not going to be too long. But happiness is like a new bar of soap. Well, if you take a new bar of soap, it's full, and you're able to get a hold of it usually, and you don't have to fight for a little small piece, you know, whatever. It's adequate. You know, you think about something like that. It's adequate. And we all like things adequate in our lives, don't we? And God provides those things. He provides those things. You know, there's also an anticipation. Uh, the reason I like a new bar of soap is because it does a good job when I'm dirty. If I'm stinky, if I'm sweaty, if my hands are dirty or whatever, I work on the farm, and a lot of you have seen the way that I am, but with the anticipation of getting clean. And so it's wonderful. You know, I, I love that. A new bar of soap. Uh, it also, you know, uh, I hate to get down kind of where the, where the calf can reach it, but what it, what it gets, gets rid of the smell, too, you know. <laughs> Sometimes, especially in the summertime, you can get that way, so it gets rid of the smell. So that's it's a wonderful thing for that. It, it, just, it does, does wonder for that. It rejuvenates and makes you feel better. And it also makes others around you feel better. It makes others around you feel better. So all of those things. Why? Because it removes the dirt, the grease, and body oils. And With me, it used to clean my hair, but it don't do it anymore. Uh, so <laughs> it, it also improves our health. Doesn't it? When we're cleaner, it, it improves our health. Uh, we remove those germs and things that would tend to harm us, you know. And so uh, all of these does do a good thing. But you know what? One thing about this, and one thing about the gospel message of salvation, with this, it requires water. you got to have water. The only other use of this without water is when Mama used to wash her mouth out of soap. But, you know, but it takes water. The gospel also takes water. You know, It takes water. The saving message. Uh, Acts twenty two sixteen. Ananias told Paul, Why tarriest thou? Why tarry? Well, you know, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Now that's very clear, isn't it? Baptism is essential. You know, uh, anybody out in, in the world today that preaches a message and leaves out baptism as being essential is, is on the wrong path because Ananias told Paul there, and there's many other places. Uh, where uh, it talks about First Peter three twenty one, brother brother Peter said the like figure wherein too even baptism doth now save us, not the putting away of the built of the flesh, washing that way, but the answer of a conscious true conscience toward God. In other words, you've heard the gospel message, you understand repentance is necessary, you understand that confession of Christ is necessary, you understand that we need to. Uh, you know, be baptized. You need to do those things necessary. The answer of a good conscience toward God that we have we have studied and know what Christ wants us to do, and and He accomplishes that because of His resurrection, because of the resurrection of Christ. We can follow through and go through those. So you know, like I said, happiness is like a new bar of soap. I like a new bar of soap, but the greatest happiness is being in Christ. There's where the true happiness is. That's, that's what we need to do. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you have, have been baptized into Christ. There we go again, you know. There's water in the plan. There's water. As many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The only way we can put on Christ or be in Christ or be in the same condition is to be baptized into Christ. It's essential as it is. When you think about clean and cleanliness and things, what in your mind is the cleanest thing that can ever be, that has always been the cleanest thing with, without imperfection, the cleanest thing that ever walked the face of is Jesus Christ? Clean. And what am I talking about, too? I'm talking about 
cleanliness within. It's true that he tried those uh, fields and trails of, of Jordan and through Galilee and things, and surely his, he must have got dust on his feet. That's true. He washed them off, cleaned them off, and he stayed clean. But Christ was the cleanest that can ever be inside because he was from God. And you know, that's what God wants us to be. He wants, he wants us to be clean, clean inside. How do you do that? We, you obey the gospel. When you obey the gospel and you're raised up, out of the watery graves and baptism, raised up to the newness of life, a new creature. That's the cleanest that you will ever, ever be. Right after at the moment of baptism, that's the cleanest that you will ever be. And God will continue to keep you clean as we walk in the light. First John uh, 1 John 1.7, as we walk in the light, His blood, Jesus' blood, continues to keep us clean. As clean as when we came out of the waters of baptism. We can stay clean, and that's that's how God. We we can we can maintain that cleanliness, and we can be as clean and be acceptable to God because God in Christ is clean, He's right, full of righteousness. So with God, there's no form of uncleanness. Righteousness is related to cleanness. Isaiah one eighteen says, "Come now, let us reason together," saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as crimson. They shall be as wool. In other words, clean and white as wool. We get clean by obeying the gospel. Hearing the word, believing that Christ is Son of God, repenting of our sins, confessing Christ, and being baptized. And also, you know, if our garment has been polluted by the flesh, as in Jude 1, uh, 23, if our garment in our daily walk of life, something has uh, come between us and God, and we we stained our garment, we can have those refreshed again. Yet, uh, even even us Christians who have been baptized, we can call upon the name of the Lord again. And we can uh, uh, come to Him in, through repentance, and uh, we can uh, ask forgiveness of the church if it is uh, something that has been done uh, that is of public nature. If not, then if a person can pray to God, say, "God, I repent. Please forgive me." Bring me back to my wanted state again. If there's anybody tonight who needs to obey the gospel or anybody who needs to come forward with prayers of repentance, then we ask you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song. Jesus is tenderly calling me home. Crawling today, crawling today, why from the sunshine above will thou roam, farther and farther away. Crawling today, crawling today,
a big leg, didn't leave it by herself up here. I might have had it and took it home with me. It was barred up, so that's good stuff. That's good stuff. We're thankful for everyone being here tonight. Uh, we encourage you to be back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for Bible class, 11 and 2 for worship, and that good good meal in between. Uh, if there are no other announcements, we will be dismissed in prayer. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, who art in heaven, we have been drawn to you this day because of the wonderful love you have for us. Sometimes, Father, we miss the mark because we don't realize how good High merciful, high loving, and high generous you have been to us. Father, I realize that we did not come to you. You came to us. You took our form and our infirmities. You suffered and died for our sin. You forgave us for all of our sin against you in order that we may have fellowship with you now and forever. Father, this Lafitte Church of Christ congregation, we thank you. We pray that we will always try to be obedient to thy will. Father, for this man servant that we heard a few minutes ago, we thank you for him and we thank you for the word he presented to us, hoping, Father, that in many ways it will help us to be a better person, a better Christian, a better husband, and a better wife, a better person to do thy will the best of our gifts. For our sick, we pray for wellness. And for those who lost loved ones, we pray for comfort. Now, Father, as we Lead this place of worship. Go with us. Keep us close to thee. Guide us where we need to be. And help us to do what we need to do. Father, we love you so much. And we know that you love us for what you've done by giving your only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for our sin. In Jesus' name, Father, I ask all these many blessings. Amen.